Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, new competition for Congress. The line panel debates which challengers have the best chance of unseating incumbents in our three congressional districts. And like many Western states, there are no inherent rights or claims that rivers have on their water. Our land explores water rights laws for rivers across our state and why they could lead to more drying on the Rio Grande. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. Monday marked the fourth official celebration of Indigenous Peoples Day here in New Mexico. In the second half of our show, the line panel and I will explore the future of colonial era tributes in Santa Fe as activists call for their removal. October also marks National Domestic Violence Awareness and Prevention Month, an effort that got a boost this year when Congress reauthorized the Violence Against Women Act. Later in the show, senior producer Lou DeVizio talks with a former family court judge and a mental health expert about the changes we can make as individuals and as a society to limit domestic violence. Of course, it's also election season, and we're getting some new perspective on a constitutional amendment that would increase accessible funding for early childhood and public education. We'll hear from a state senator who argues withdrawing more money isn't the responsible step right now. But first, we're zeroing in on three other major votes coming up in November, our races for Congress. Will our three incumbents be able to hold on to their seats as new district lines make those contests more competitive? Let's get to the line. Welcome to our line opinion panelists this week. We have Julia Goldberg. She's senior correspondent for the Santa Fe Reporter. Former state representative and House Minority Whip Daniel Foley is with us. And it's great to have Giovanna Rossi, president of Collective Action Strategies, back with us as well. Thank you all for being here. Now, all three congressional, congressional districts have changed after the state's new redistricting process process in quotes there, of course, and that means new challenges for those incumbents and their opponents. Let's start in District 1, where incumbent Democrat Melanie Stansbury is taking on Republican challenger Michelle Garcia Holmes. Again, now that her district has stretched to the south and east, Daniel, Ms. Stansbury will have to reach more conservative voters, which was the goal here. But like most Democrats, she's leaning heavily on her abortion rights platform. Is this the issue should, she should be focusing on given how that district has morphed a little bit from redistricting? Yeah, definitely not the issue she should be focusing on in southeastern and eastern New Mexico. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at any map of the Bible Belt that goes up through Kansas and Oklahoma, it starts here and it starts right there in southeastern New Mexico. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the real question is going to be is, will they turn out in the numbers they need to turn out for a Republican to win? You know, the the seats, which I think is kudos to the legislature, I'm surprised that it got signed, but all those seats are a lot more competitive now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we used to have, if you think about it first, we really had one heavy Democrat seat, one heavy Republican seat, and for a while there, as your former boss could, could attest to, we had sort of a toss-up seat, right? right? And over the course of time, two of them moved heavy Democrat, one of them stayed heavy Republican, and now all three of them are fairly in play. I mean, they're, all three of them, there's an opportunity that they're going to be be rolling out there. I, I think it's a bad move. I do think it's going to be interesting to see how the Albuquerque Journal's endorsement plays out. Uh, it's rare that the Albuquerque Journal, Journal endorses a, a challenger over an incumbent without there being some extenuating circumstances, right? Criminal activity, sure. something bad, or just a out and out uh, policy stance against folks at the Journal Editorial Board. But to see the Journal Editorial Board uh, endorse a Republican uh, over an incumbent Democrat was was sort of an interesting deal. That should play well in meeting with the local media, uh, the smaller newspapers and local media in those southeastern New Mexico towns. I do think that, uh, you know, uh, some of my friends, a lot of my friends in southeastern New Mexico that are in that district still don't know who either candidate is, right. and that's not a good showing for a challenger. That's an interesting point you just made, the last point. I I'm curious how this campaigning in these, in these new districts shape up after the, all the votes come in. Uh, Giovanna, the Republican challenger in uh, CD1, Michelle Garcia Holmes, I mentioned, has a strong background in law enforcement, consistently targeting crime as a top issue while appealing to more rural and conservative areas of the district. I is that going to be enough to gain enough votes in Albuquerque with that approach? Kind of a flip of the question I asked Dan about rural stuff. How, do you, how does she balance that here in Albuquerque? 
I mean, crime is a top issue in in the campaigns, and uh, certainly it's right out of the playbook for the Republicans right now, all across all of the races. Uh, so she's that that will you know help her. Um, I think still though, going back to what Dan said, I, I think the uh, the the redistricting is going to be interesting mm -hmm. and a little bit of a wild card as we figure out how it's really going to play out. So um, I, I think, you know, she can try to, you know, to to do that and talk about that. But I don't know that the message is really getting out. So they have, you know, she has this platform and she's saying all this stuff, but who's who's actually listening and and mm -hmm. who who is hearing the message um, and for Congresswoman Stansbury, she, uh, you know, has a little bit of an edge with being in Congress already, but she hasn't been there that long. And, you know, again, with the Albuquerque Journal endorsement of uh, her challenger, um, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens here. Mm -hmm. Good point there. Also yet to come is that uh, classic Albuquerque Journal poll that's, that runs just before. We'll see what happens there. Uh, Julia, interesting. Moving on to CD2, incumbent Republican Yvette Harrell has taken on Democratic challenger Gabe Vasquez. If you've been watching TV recently, you know this race, you, you know the advertising battle. This race has gotten particularly ugly. And again, the incumbent will likely have a tougher time as District 2 now includes parts of Albuquerque, including the South Valley. So I'm wondering, in your opinion, will Ms. Harrell's rural base be enough to overcome that change in the things that uh, the voters that are up here and closer to the Emerald City of Albuquerque? Um, I don't know. I know that it, you know, 538 has District 2 in its list of 12 seats that are possible to flip Democrat. They've got, I think, they've got it with 43 mm -hmm. to 100 odds. So I do think it's it's in play, as Dan, um, as Dan put it. And I also think, you know, the incumbent is one of the more... Um, extreme candidates in this election in terms of uh, Republican candidates um, and certainly more extreme than in uh, the third congressional district in terms of her stances about uh, the 2020 election and such. So I think uh, he's right to be attacking her along those lines in mm -hmm. terms of making that public. So I think it's not outside the realm and certainly the redistricting makes it more possible than it would have been. Mm -hmm. Dan, interestingly, that district's voting age population went from 51% to 56% Hispanic. I'm wondering if, there's a, if that might be uh, uh, somewhat influential here in the voting here. But I, I, same question, can Ms. Harrell pull off something here in this new area of her district up here in Albuquerque? She's been campaigning, but it seems like she's been relying on television much more than being up here and knocking on a whole lot of doors. What's your sense of that? Well, I think, I think, you know, I think there's a couple of things. I think she's, you know, it, it's a long ways from Cruces to here. Right. And there's a complete stark difference between the constituencies, right? Mm -hmm. So you can really run, you can really run uh, a foul coming up here and saying one thing and then going back to Roswell or wherever and saying the complete difference. Um, and so I think it's a smart move to kind of pick your, pick your place and say, listen, I'm going to stick to a message. I think clearly her message is border security and crime. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, the defund the police stuff that she's tried to attach to her opponent, um, some of which has been, uh, you know, there's been questions about whether it's true or not. Some of it's been pointed out that he's made some 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 comments. I think if she sticks with those things, I think that's going to play well in the South Valley of, of Albuquerque because crime is it's a major issue in New Mexico. It's a unbelievably major issue in Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. And it is crime is, you know, from what I'm seeing and people that I talk to, uh, my small circle, crime is really starting to cross partisan lines, right? I mean, even even some pretty liberal Democrat friends of mine are like, this is enough. I mean, we've got to figure something out. Mm -hmm. And so I think as long as she continues to paint him as a defund the police, far left progressive Democrat in that district, I think it plays very well to her. I also think it doesn't hurt her when people say that she's an extremist, she's very far right. I think in that district, that plays better to the base, right? In that district, the more right you are. I mean, we're talking about a place where, you know, a guy who literally started Cowboys for Trump is still, you know, still getting standing ovations at county commission meetings and people are still 
uh, heavily in support of him. And and whether you agree with it or disagree with it, I think that makes up a solid uh, amount of the of the of the district. And at the end of the day, I think that's the base in that district, mm-hmm. and I think that's what's going to drive people. It's the same with CD three that we're going to talk about. Yep. The left is going to drive that district. The right's going to drive, I think, CD two. Thanks uh, for the handover there for uh, for Giovanna there and in, in CD three incumbent Democrat Teresa. Leisure Fernandez has taken on Republican challenger Alexis Martinez Johnson for the second time, of course. Now, Ms. Leisure Fernandez is relying on her record in Congress, where she helped pass that $2.5 billion in wildfire relief. And Martinez Johnson is focus, focusing on broader issues like inflation, the economy, and that uh, position was highlighted in a major recent ad where Ms. Martinez Johnson says the Democratic Party abandoned my abuelos. Could that type of messaging flip this district, Giovanna? Is it, or is it enough? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I was looking at her uh, campaign ads and she is definitely honing in on um, her her heritage and, mm-hmm. and her, you know, grandparents. Um, I don't know that it's going to be enough. I, I think she is um, she's sort of throwing a lot out and seeing what's sticking and i'm not sure much sure. is sticking mm-hmm. um and so i i see the incumbent uh doing doing well there in that district a reminder uh ms leisure fernandez ran away with it 58.7 percent to 41.3 last time around uh julia uh, just real quick here got about a minute and a half all three of these new newly drawn districts appear to be more competitive appear we don't know until the votes come in now which challenger is the best shot of unseating an incumbent here uh, given this new this new sort of landscape we're dealing with well i'm inclined to think a vasquez i'm inclined to think that's the one where you're most likely to see an upset but that might be wishful thinking i tend to i tend to watch my election predictions are all based on what i want to have happen and they're not often correct so. <laughs> i hear you. you wouldn't be alone on that dan your thought on that real quick are we as competitive I, 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 as we look i think we're i think it's competitive i think they're all going to be uh, more competitive, which is going to, I think, entice better candidates to run in the future. So I think uh-huh. you're going to see these races be. I would say the one that has the best chance of changing would be CD1, the Albuquerque Journal endorsement and the fact that it's urban and there's a constant message that I think can resonate. I think CD2 is definitely in place. CD3 is there's no chance. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's going to stay Democrat. Uh, I think CD2 will probably stay Republican, but it'll be a very, very close race. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised to see Gabe running again in two years. Good point there. Thanks to our line opinion panel on that. Starting next week, New Mexico in Focus will bring you exclusive interviews with key contenders for governor, Navajo Nation president, and our three congressional districts we just discussed. New Mexico in Focus's candidate conversations begin next week on NMPBS. As we all get ready for Election Day, November 8th, a group of organizations here in New Mexico and nationally are working to re-incentivize civil discourse and bipartisan collaboration across government. New Mexico First and the Election Reformers Network are just two groups working to promote a new initiative from the Carter Center, a set of candidate principles for trusted elections. The bipartisan effort is meant to encourage candidates, political parties, and voters to uphold five core doctrines of democratic elections, integrity, nonviolence, security, oversight, and the peaceful transfer of power. Senior producer Lou DeVizio spoke with two people about how they plan to use this initiative and others to decrease political polarization in our state and in our country. It's election season and joining me today are two people who are dedicating to keeping the electoral process open and accessible for all voters. We have Heather Ballas, she's the Vice President of Programs at the Election Reformers Network, and she's also the former Executive Director of New Mexico First. Danielle Gonzalez is the current Executive Director of New Mexico First. Uh, It's an organization that's meant to engage New Mexicans in policy, ideally pushing them towards democratic action. Thank you both for being here. The level of polarization is undeniably growing nationally here in New Mexico. Are there philosophies that have changed within political parties or society as a whole that have contributed to this? Yeah, I think it's no question that our democracy is in crisis. And it's not just the democracy overall, but it's the fabric that holds us together as a society. And I think one key change that has happened over the last 10 to 15 years is in politics, there used to be incentives to work across the aisle. When New Mexico First was founded in 1986, it was founded by Senator Domenici and Senator Bingaman, a Republican and a Democrat, who had experience of working together and saw the true benefits of working together. 
Now we live in a society where if you're a Democrat who works with Republicans frequently or you're a Republican who works with Democrats frequently, you get called bad things. Mm -hmm. And it really makes me think about, there's this comic that I saw, I think it's a Far Side comic, and it's two dogs sitting at a bar, and they're drinking a martini, and one dog's <laughs> turning to the other and says, it's not enough that us dogs win, the cats have to lose too. And that really is how things are reflected in society today. And it's not just the partisan differences that I think are increased, it's just, it's hard for us as Americans, as New Mexicans, to work across difference, to work across urban versus rural, or age, but gender, race, there's just become so much divisiveness in our society overall, which has huge implications, not just for democracy and elections, but also education and healthcare and so many other important issues. I think the biggest drivers of the changes are um, social media and the rise of cable news. Um, as At least I, I would say those are very significant drivers of the type of um, polarization that Danielle is talking about. Those, both of those types of entities, whether for um, uh, easy ratings or multiple clicks tend to say that every issue is divided upon an extreme right and an extreme left, right? It's easy to book guests that take that approach um, and it's easy to put the extremists um, on screen because they're the ones that are going to say the most outlandish things and the things that are most going to be quickest and easiest to go and forward. But the, in my view, the taking of any issue and, and boiling it down to an extreme right and an extreme left is unconscionably reductive. Now these candidate principles, can you describe exactly what you're asking candidates to do? They're sort of predicated on the notion that the same notion that we all probably got in seventh grade social studies, the one that says democracy is predicated on the consent of the governed, right? Consent of the governed means that we, as the, as the uh, people that are willing to be governed, say, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm on board. We're on board if we have confidence in our leaders and we have confidence in the process that, by which those leaders were selected. So there's um, a whole host of ways that we can strengthen those things. One of them the, uh, would be these candidate principles for trusted elections that do ask our um, candidates for public office to um, agree to five baseline principles for practical um, and ethical behavior as it comes to how they're running for office. And that includes being honest about the electoral process, um, that includes um, denouncing threats um, or acts of violence against their opponent or their opponent's family or election workers. Uh, that includes respecting people's right to vote with it free of intimidation. That includes ensuring that uh, poll workers themselves are, uh, that are representing candidates behave respectfully when they're doing that um, poll watching job. And lastly, and probably most importantly, is adhering to the rule of law. That means um, recognizing um, at the end of the day who won or lost the election. And that's not saying that if somebody who's running for office can't call for recounts and can't um, take concerns to the courts, um, but at the end of the day, once all of those legal contestations are decided, um, we're asking candidates to say, we'll follow the rule of law and, and accept the results as are ultimately decided either by election officials or the courts. Now, Danielle, is, are you aware that this is something that New Mexican voters wanted to see, to know that this is where their candidates are coming from? Yeah, which is fascinating and kind of counter to the whole conversation that we were just happen having. Uh, but yes, there's actually been polling about this. When you ask people, do you would you vote for candidates who would stand up for what's right, who would follow the honest processes, who would support the results of the election? People actually say yes, and it's pretty compelling. Um, and so we're really excited about that and excited to be one of the organizations here in New Mexico leading the Candidate Principles Project. Um, but it's not just New Mexico first, so it's the New Mexico Chamber of Commerce, uh, New Mexico Open Ele Elections, the New Mexico Local News Fund, New Mexico Public Broadcasting Service. It's exciting that there's so many mm -hmm. organizations that just represent a variety of perspectives here in New Mexico coming together to work on this project, which is essentially reaching out to candidates across the state and asking them, will you sign on to these principles? And then a whole second part of it that is promoting that to the voters. And again, as we just discussed, it's really exciting that voters are actually saying, you know what, this is something that might guide and inform my vote. Now, 
uh, you mentioned to me in our pre-conversation about some reforms that could happen to also push this along. So it's not directly tied to the candidate principles. It's instead sure. a standalone bill that um, uh, we hope will be introduced in the upcoming legislative session. And it's focused on the role of the Secretary of State and our county clerks. And just this week, the Election Reformers Network has released new national polling data um, that, asks, that asked voters how important it was that their election administrators behave in an impartial manner. And it won't surprise you to know that Democrats, Republicans alike, they want this badly. They think it's very important to the tune of 95% of them think it's very important. Um, and then when you take the, that group, though, and you pull it down a little bit further, 66 68 percent of them, two-thirds roughly, um, of the folks uh, polled also said that they have a hard time trusting their, uh, the impartiality of their election officials when those folks are elected with the backing of a major party. And so this is America. That's how we do it, right? We elect people in a partisan election. But the thing is that we don't, doesn't have to be done that way. And so the opportunity to say, how do we sort of depoliticize those roles um, also has a profound effect on the confidence that voters have that the election's being administered fairly. So the bill that we're looking to introduce um, would do three things, uh, and they're just common sense, simple things. The, uh, one is that election officials would be prohibited from uh, uh, endorsing candidates in the election that they're overseeing, which most people go, well, aren't they prohibited from doing that already? And the answer is they're not prohibited, but most of them don't do it. Um, it would also prohibit them from fundraising for candidates um, in the elections they're overseeing. And it would require them to recuse themselves if there was an election dispute over their own race. Um, so three simple common sense things. In doing that, the Suggestion is not being made because we're trying to be accusatory or imply that those folks are doing their, doing their jobs badly right now. I think quite the contrary. They're doing um, heroic work, a job that's really hard, and in the political environment we're in is getting harder every day. Now looking ahead to November 8th, is there anything that either of you would be looking for, some sort of a barometer through voters, through uh, public perceptions that we're on the right track, moving a little bit away from that ultra polarization and towards strengthening and reinvigorating our democracy. I mean, I think I would re be remiss to not mention the candidate principles. Sure. And so to the degree to which candidates are willing to sign on to those principles and which voters are saying these matter to me, I think that's a huge indicator and barometer that this is important. I think the other is obviously voter turnout rates. That's critically important. Um, and then I think once the election comes and goes, we really need to have folks accept results when it's clear. And so to Heather's point earlier, it's entirely acceptable to issue challenges, to ask for recounts, but there is a point at which candidates and their parties and their supporters must accept those results. So I think if all of those things happen, I think that's the best indicator that we are in a, in a good place. But I, but I won't pretend that it all is gonna end on November 10th. Right? Like, this is the midterm election. We've got another election coming in in two years. And so this is just going to continue to build. Um, so I'm really excited to think about this as sort of a first step, or all of these initiatives together as first steps to help rebuild what has begun to, to, to break and, and to um, have some cracks, as we talked kind of sort of at the beginning of the interview. Heather, something you'll be looking for in this election moving into 2024 also? Something that I'm looking for right now on the candidate principles front is not just for the candidates themselves to sign on to those, but also for organizations and voters. And so one of the things I would share with your viewers is that whether they're running for office or whether they simply like the concept that people would say, um, yes, I want my candidate to take this kind of approach, they can um, voice their support um, signing on to the principles that we've talked about um, at any time at the website principledcandidates.org. Heather Ballas, Danielle Gonzalez, thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Water in New Mexico is managed on what's called the priority administration system. And this is like most other Western states managed on a similar system. And it's a really, it's a system of extraction. It's, it's a winner take all kind of system. Um, and how it works is that permits are issued for water right users until there's no water left. Another item up for a vote next month could increase the amount of accessible funding for early childhood and public education. 
Constitutional Amendment 1, located on the back of your ballot, would increase the amount of money taken out of the Permanent Education Fund, also known as the Land Grant Permanent Fund. Now, two weeks ago, we brought you a perspective from educators and parents on this issue. They all say a yes vote is a vote for our children's future. But some lawmakers question whether taking out extra money right now is prudent or even necessary. This week, senior producer Lou DeVizio catches up with State Senator Bill Scherer to understand why he thinks keeping that money where it is makes the most sense right now. Now, Senator, you are publicly opposed to this constitutional amendment. Can you explain your position? So the, the basic problem is that we already put the money into an early childhood trust fund. So the way we built this as a legislature a couple years ago, uh, we took the excess oil and gas revenue. So above and beyond what we normally get. And we funneled it into this uh, early childhood trust fund. So it started out with about $300 million. Uh, next year, it's gonna be $2 billion. The year after that, it's gonna be $4.8 billion based on the, the estimated revenue that we're gonna get from oil and gas. Ultimately, it ends up close to $9 billion. And if so if you simply take the, the interest off of that, uh, you more than get the two, $250 million uh, that, that this constitutional amendment would take out of the, the uh, land grant permanent fund. So there's no point in taking it out. The money is already there. It's already in a trust fund that was built. It's growing. It's going to continue to grow until it gets to about $9 billion. And so there's no point in doing harm to the trust fund. I mean, to the permanent fund. The permanent fund was established in 1910, but the real reason for it was to make sure that we had money for public schools, they call them common schools in 1910, uh, to fund the schools forever uh, after, the, after the fund got big enough. Prudent investment says that you should not take out more than 5%. We're at 5%. So when you add that other one and a uh, half percent, one and a quarter percent, uh, you are now risking depleting the core of that fund. Um, people will say, oh, no, it grows at 11%. Well, it grew at 11% when the stock market was strong. It's losing money today. And, you know, there'll be ups and downs. Um, but the point is, is that this should grow. We should use the power of compound interest to make this fund bigger and bigger and bigger until it completely funds education. All we have to do is make sure we don't, uh, you know, deplete that fund and, and the interest off of that fund then, then takes care of the early childhood funding uh, that, that we agree we need. I'm not, I'm not arguing that point. I'm arguing that the money's already there. If the money's already there, why not make it accessible? You, you want to save it over the long haul so that in five to 10 years we have we are safe with the amount of money that we have, is that correct? So if we go back to 2003, uh, we moved what we take out of that land grant permanent fund from 4.7% to 5.8. Mm -hmm. The whole purpose of that was to fund education because we were 49th, 48th or 49th in education and we needed to fix it now and we have the money now and we better do it now, it's a once in a lifetime thing now. And so we took out extra money. And what did it do for us? Well, it did two things. One, it left us at 48 or 49th in education. It did nothing because we didn't have a plan. The whole plan was more money, not what are you gonna do with the money? The second thing that it did is today, we would have about 200 million extra dollars a year coming out of that based on the growth of the fund, which would have funded early childhood. So, so we accomplished nothing on one end, and we harmed ourselves on the other by, by eliminating that $200 million. And that's all because of the power of compound interest. So, you know, once you take that money out, there's no compounding. So it's gotta be there to compound. And once you compound it, you have more. It's just that simple. Two weeks ago on New Mexico in Focus, I spoke with Wilhelmina Yazzie. She's the lead plaintiff in the Yazzie Martinez lawsuit. And we talked about the proposed amendment. She says the extra money is key in reaching the goals set in that ruling. How would you propose reaching those goals, not just the financial ones, but the institutional changes without using the extra money that's included in this amendment? Well, again, 
We've been 48th or 49th or 50th now uh, in education for a long time. And what we've done is we've poured more and more and more money into education with zero results. I don't see a plan, uh, a, a solid plan for the early childhood money that we have today. We're already spending money on that about $40 million right now, <clears throat> but we don't have the capacity to do any more than that. <clears throat> it's just, we don't know what to do with it. We don't have the systems, we don't have the staff, but $40 million is a start. Next year, it's gonna be about $120 million that, that will be usable without the land grant permanent fund money based on the oil and gas money that we put into the early childhood uh, trust fund. So we don't need to take any more out of there. It's going to grow. The trust fund is going to grow. And so in this particular case, it gives us time to build the plan, to build the infrastructure, to build the capacity, because the way the money is going to come in and without harming what's going to happen in the future. Would you like to see a briefing from PED with more specifics? You mentioned they mentioned goals, but not an actual plan to reach those goals. Is that all something that is on PED to provide to legislators, to provide to the public so that we know how this money would be used? Uh, absolutely, that's what we need. So we get briefings from PED all the time. Um, and I do think that Dr. Steinhaus is, is, is doing a good job. He's trying, uh, he's, he's really involved. I think we've had a series of uh, superintendents uh, that aren't doing this, uh, cabinet secretaries that aren't, you know, they're all about the goals and, and saying really cool things, but it's not, it's not about saying anything, it's about doing something. So, you know, an intention is not a result, as, as some people are saying. And so we need to see results. What are you doing? Thank you to Senator Scherer for his time. The Early Childhood Education and Care Department has a four-year finance plan that estimates specific funding needs through 2026. You can find that link to that information online at our 2022 election page. Just go to nmpbs.org and click on the election banner. And you can watch Lou's interview with educators and advocates for Constitutional Amendment 1, including Wilhelmina Yazi. That's online right now at the New Mexico in Focus YouTube page. Now, time to bring in the Line Opinion panel once more to talk about the future of multiple monuments in the city of Santa Fe. Protesters demonstrated in front of the memorial to Kit Carson Monday while honoring Indigenous Peoples Day. In the plaza, dancers and other Native groups gathered in front of the remnants of the Soldiers Monument, which was toppled in 2020. Right now, there's no consensus on how we should move forward with either of these monuments. But let's start with Kit Carson, a Native activist and others. One, it taken down Julia Goldberg because of Kit Carson's role in colonizing the West, specifically the Long Walk of 1864, which forced Navajo families from their land with many deaths that happened. Is that step one here? Is that the focus of this argument? Is Kit Carson, that statue, is that what we start? or? Is this just part of a bigger conversation here? I think it's part of a much bigger conversation. You know, in the aftermath of the toppling of the Plaza Obelisk, the city mm -hmm. hired a contractor and just and had a years long process of conversations and surveys that um, that group submitted a report in August to mm -hmm. a final report. It's 145 pages long. It has an additional 100 page appendix. Um, wow. It's very long, in other words, wow. and it was based on they did a lot of public conversations, again, surveys, and I called the city yesterday to find out where things were at. They, the city council is having a study session on that report um, at the beginning of November and not voting on anything, but starting to kind of unpack what well, is a very robust report. And, I, you know, one thing that stuck out to me in that report was that the um, contractors are for life said they spent the first three months meeting with people who thought they were entering a process like Albuquerque had when it dealt with the Anyate, um statue. That'd be three months. The contractor would say, okay, here's what you have to do. Whereas Santa Fe's process wasn't to say, tell us what to do with the obelisk. It was like, unpack everything that's happened and why this is happening. And so you've got 200 pages of people weighing in about racism, about their experiences um, with racism, about how Santa Fe has dealt with cultural differences, how it should deal with cultural differences. And they did not make a recommendation other than they said, you need to be more transparent because even 
even people who are on completely different opposite sides of these equations agree on one thing, which is that the city has not done a good job at handling it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. part of that has been that they are not communicating what is going on. I mean, I had to call the city and say, what's, what's going on at this point? Um, so they're recommending that some signage be put up right now where there's a box that says, here's what's happened and here's what's happening next, here's our process, uh -huh. and that the city needs to decide are you going to restore the obelisk and put it up? There are two options, they said, was restore it, put it up, and have new language that explains, puts it in context, or put something new up. And to, and create a process to decide which of those things you're going to do and how you're going to do it. So mm -hmm. that's kind of where it stands. I think, you know, by the time uh, climate change destroys the planet, something will have been decided that's that's my prediction on that. Whichever comes first, exactly. Yes. Julie, just one more question, Julia, real quick. Yeah. The board chairwoman, chairwoman for the Santa Fe Indigenous Center says she's heard ideas for alternatives like a fountain or two statues to honor a prestigious Native American and a prestigious Hispanic person. It, it, you know, what have you heard about what the alt plans might be if the Carson statue actually comes down? You know, I don't think there's been any specific solicitation about replacing specific things. There's been conversations in general about public art, and I have heard people talk um, both about wanting something that re is more multicultural, more representing of multiculture rather than triculture or a specific culture, and then a lot of discussions about fountains and water. Right. Um, <laughs> That's always so. safe, a fountain with water. <laughs> who, who hates water? Exactly right. Uh, right Giov a statue of Betty White, the one thing we all agree we like, something like that. That's right. Yeah. You know, Giovanna, um, back to the plaza here for a quick second. The base of the Soldiers Monument is still standing. As Julia just mentioned, all this covered with paneling. But also, as Julia mentioned, it's been two years since protesters brought the top of it down. The city has done these assessments, but still no action. At what point must they make a decision on the future of that landmark? Is there something politically that has to happen here quickly? Or just probably better said, for the soul of the community. I mean, this can't keep dragging out and having people at loggerheads like this. Yeah, I mean, as Julia pointed out, the the city is, uh, you know, they've gone through this long process. They're not apparently communicating where they are. Um, and, and I think with these, with, with this and, and other situations like this, uh, the process is really important. And I think they're trying to, you know, honor that and facilitate a, a space for people to be heard. And I think that's important. Mm -hmm. So so we're talking about process and then there's product, right? Like, so after the process, what's the product? Where, when are we going to see a resolution? Um, and it, it seems that that there, we're at the point where a resolution is needed um, with that specifically and uh, it, you know generally, because now we're seeing it with other monuments. Uh, but I, yeah, I do think that the process is is important, and, and there needs to be um, time and space and and capacity to hear uh. from the folks who are protesting. We have a long history of protesting in this state, in this country. So you know, I don't think we should be surprised that people are now protesting on an Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, however, yeah, like what you know how are the public officials responding how are we creating space for all voices to be heard and mm -hmm. then and then let's get to a, a resolution mm -hmm. good point there uh daniel interesting uh another gesture this week governor lujan grisham on monday voted f voided four pre-statehood proclamations that targeted native, native americans during the 19th century we keep finding these things written into our history the language is is like horrific even given the times about hunting Native American people down and killing them. It's just, should we commit to a full audit of everything, put it on the table and said, this stays, this goes, this stays, this goes. Are we at that point now? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, listen, this is gonna rile everybody up and everybody's gonna get their jaws going with what I'm gonna say. But, mm -hmm. you know, at some point we have to realize our history isn't always pleasant, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of things that we've done in this country that are not good, that were bad. And I think trying to wipe it away and trying to say, listen, we're going to we're going to remove this. We're going to get rid of that. 
I think I I personally think is a bad move. I think you know future generations being able to see that people actually felt this way, thought this way, acted this way. I think that's the guardrail that keeps people from doing bad things in the future. When you realize not only do we hear people have, are, could do bad things, there it is in writing that they actually felt this way. I mean, I'm I'm reminded of my time in the legislature. We we changed the constitution we cleaned up some legal legislation when i was in i mean my wife is half japanese and when i was in there was a law on the books in new mexico that said people of asian descent could not own property in new mexico yep. it was against the law yep. still when i was in the legislature now nobody been prosecuted under that my wife's on my mortgage she she owns everything i don't I, i'm on her mortgage you know i mean so so at the end of the day i think in this in this desire for us to want to quote unquote feel good, we run the risk of forgetting the bad things that made us who we are, good and bad things. Is, that it, made a, us who we is, are. is it a question of forgetting or ignoring, or is, it, or is it a question of just sort of reframing and representing these things that's in a, great a different question. way? No, that's a great question. I, I, th I think when you wipe it away, Gene, you're going to forget it. When it goes away, it's going to be forgotten. And okay. I think that, you know, I think it's a different conversation about statues and, and monuments. You know, I think some of these monuments that that have no real, you know, that have a meaning based on it's different than tearing down a monument of a person. Right. Some of these people, you may not like what they represent in history, but they represent history. And so, you know, I think that at the end of the day, uh, we are losing focus on the fact that not all of our history is great. It's important to teach our kids this bad part of the history that has happened, because if we don't understand our history, we're destined to repeat that history. Yeah, but I don't think that we are teaching our kids that. So, uh, you're right. I think we're not you're teaching assuming, our kids that. We're moving. No, no, I we're moving that, the future. I think that you're assuming things. that these quote unquote bad things are in the past, where actually they're still happening. I mean, not, not exactly the same, but it's still happening. So it's not like, Oh, that's all over now. Let's just leave it. Well, I, I think it's it is. Like, I think when you compare, I think we to... have to really look at um, what part of our history is still our current reality for a lot of people, and uh, and address it that way. And and this whole uh, perspective of of you know putting it in the books and and leaving it is a very dominant culture centered perspective and if we are going to include the perspective of other cultures that aren't in the dominant culture um we, we need to be listening we need to have a process for listening and for moving forward and for not um just saying that it's all in the past. Process is tough. I mean, South Africa went through this with apartheid years ago. There's been models out there how, about how to get communities to, as Julie, Julia mentioned earlier, you got to get a lot of voices in. I'm not surprised that report's as big as it is. Uh, well, so we'll and, and see Jane, what, you know, mm -hmm. I would say too, I mean, it's a really interesting report and there, it has more than, it doesn't make a recommendation on the obelisk, but it mm -hmm. has a lot of recommendations of other ways to keep having the conversation. My concern would be, I don't, I think building a process around expecting people to maybe read a 145 page report might be optimistic, right. but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> That's the government way though. That's how we get out information. <laughs> Thanks again to our line panel. As always, now be sure to let us know what you think about any of the topics the line covered on our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram pages. And catch any episodes you may have missed on the PBS video app on your Roku or Smart TV. Now, October is Domestic Violence Awareness and Prevention Month, and the reinstatement of a decades-old bill in Washington could plan, could a big role in curbing that type of abuse. Senior producer Lou DeVizio wanted to learn more about the National Violence Against Women Act and some of the mental health factors that contribute to domestic violence. This week on the show, he speaks with Larry Jones, a retired family court judge, and also Joni Jones, a mental health expert and advocate who's been invited to join Senator Ben Ray Lujan's consortium on mental health. Many of us have an idea of what we think domestic violence is, but you can get caught in that mindset of, you know, it's not gonna happen to me, so I don't need to think about it so much, but that's obviously not always the case. In your work in family court, what have you found are some of the common misconceptions about domestic violence? Well, probably the greatest misconception is that it has to be physical. A lot of times people hear the term domestic violence and they assume it means a, a husband hitting a wife or a dating partner assaulting you know, uh, the other partner. But domestic violence can get a lot more involved than that. It can involve non-physical forms of abuse, harassment, cyber harassment, stalking. 
Sometimes people are in an abusive relationship and they don't even recognize that, it, that they were in an abusive relationship for some period of time. So there, that's one misconception. And another huge misconception that many in the public have is, is the question they ask sometimes, why doesn't the person who was being abused just leave, as if it's a free voluntary choice to just pick up and go? And there are so many complicating factors in a domestic situation which can make it very difficult for someone to leave even if they're being abused. There may be children involved. There may be financial dependency. There may be all types of emotional and psychological issues going on in the relationship, perhaps a codependent relationship. There may be generalized fear. There may be public, public shame. You know, for some people may feel that way even though they've done nothing wrong. So it can get very complicated and the study of domestic violence has really taken on, you know, much more steam, much more strength in the last, I'd say, 10 to 20 years. Now, Joni, through your work, you found PTSD and other mental health factors can have a major impact on domestic violence, the cycle of domestic violence. How does our understanding of mental health as a society, including access to mental health service, play into this equation? Yeah, well, the um, post-traumatic stress becomes a very important issue because it, in my experience working with people, it stifles people, so it um, really generates an underlying fear. And um, they think that when they have uh, mental health challenges that they're gonna go on maybe some medication to address you know, the PTSD or the anxiety or the depression. But one of the biggest misconceptions is medications do not skill build. So what they do is they may um, assist in um, their attention, their ability to focus um, and, and learn because sitting, attending and focusing are the prerequisites of learning. So many people think, oh, gee, you know, let me take the medication and then that's gonna make everything go away. They don't understand that it doesn't have that skill building um, component. Many people want the trauma to go away and trauma doesn't go away. We can't erase events in our lives. And they have to learn how to manage it. And triggers can happen at any time. You don't, you, you don't know when those triggers are gonna happen. So when they understand that response and they're getting that, oh, you know, there's an alert that there's some type of threat or the danger, they can learn to push that pause button. When they learn to push that pause button, it becomes very important because when you go to high levels of those hormone surges, you're actually put into the part of the brain where you become very impulsive, very reactionary, and you go on to the what ifs, what you believe is happening. And since there's no logical thinking, there is no decision-making capabilities. So we really have to teach people to manage it so that they can get to the part of the brain that is non-reactionary, that it looks logically at things and they're able to make informed decisions. Now you talk about trauma and skill building. Those are particularly important through your work. I know you found this for children who witness domestic violence and other sorts of trauma. Can you explain how children, how we can help children who do have to deal with those scenarios? Yeah, it, it becomes very important because um, we have to recognize that everybody has their individual responses. Some people may adapt to it as being norm. You know, they're, they're learning. We're, we're not born with knowledge. We're born with the ability to learn. And if that's what they're learning, then that is what they, um, they just might adapt. And we have to look at what happens when the children even go into young adults, you know, or adults. Are they going to um, not recognize the signs of any type of abuse um, because uh, it, they've adapted it to uh, the norm? Have they become a perpetrator themselves, you know, because of that, that learned behavior? Or as adults, have they gone into where they become more empathetic and they take an opposite approach and they will not you know, carry on any of the traits of the abuser. So it's very you know, individualized. Earlier this year, President Biden signed into law the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. Can you describe for our viewers how that action will help increase awareness and enforcement? What the federal bill does, it does several things um, that are helpful. First of all, it's a funding bill. So it provides a lot of funding for state agencies and nonprofit organizations to basically 
um, provide services and resources to survivors of domestic violence, as well as training for law enforcement, for educators, things like that. Uh, number two, it provides a, a great roadmap, in my opinion, of public policy straight from Washington about the importance of preventing or fighting domestic violence. Because if you read through the act, and it's a lengthy act, but if you read through even the summaries, you'll see that they focus on um, inclusive type language to try to protect and recognize that there's been domestic violence in a lot of underserved communities. The disabled, the elderly, like Joni was talking about, um, um, uh, in, in rural areas, young children, the LBGTQ community, the, um, the uh, Native American community, and which is important and obviously in New Mexico and other parts of the, of the country. And also, from a legal standpoint, the bill is very important in New Mexico because it provides um, tribal jurisdiction on certain criminal acts that previously did not exist or existed on almost a limited basis. It was expanded so that if domestic violence um, abuse occurs on tribal lands, that it can be, there can be consequences against a defendant greater than there were previously. Anything that people should know about domestic violence, about their understanding, about our society's understanding on it during this month? Yes. If, first of all, if anyone feels that they are um, uh, the subject of domestic violence, they should seek help. And there are lots of different ways to seek help. You can consult. There are many good organizations in New Mexico and throughout the country, nonprofit organizations, governmental organizations, that their whole function or a large part of, of why they are there is to help people um, who are in a, a, a situation um, where it's abusive, where it's violent. Domestic violence doesn't just go away on its own. Um, to stay silent about it, um, even though you can understand why some people historically have chosen to, um, very often it gets worse. Joni, final word to you. Um, what should people know during this month about resources, about how they should handle a situation like this? Well, I really think there needs to be a public awareness because, as Larry alluded to, many people don't talk about um, the abuse that's going on. And, um, and there's various reasons for that. You know, we should look at a, any type of change that we see occurring in, in an individual and to be very comfortable to even talk about it because one of the things um, that I, I do want the public to know, and this is a very big misconception because when we're talking about mental health and we're talking about depression and people feel that there's no way out, they start to contemplate suicide. And people think that if they ask somebody if they are suicidal, that they're gonna put that thought into their head. And that is not the case. It's not the case at all. There's a lot of research on it. It's just, again, another conversational starter. And I think that's what the public needs to be aware of, you know, the vigilance, the awareness, and to take action on that. Thank you to Joni and Larry Jones. You can watch Lou's full interview with them online right now on the New Mexico and Focus YouTube page. That includes perspective on some of the legal difficulties that result when domestic violence victims recant their statements. We also have a variety of resources for people who might be involved in a violent domestic situation. Just look in the description of the story on our YouTube page or on social media. Finally tonight, we all watched the Rio Grande dry in Albuquerque this summer, something we'll likely see more of in the coming years as the region continues to heat up and dry out. And while we hate to see that happen, there's nothing in state law to prevent the Rio Grande from drying again or to keep people from using every last drop of water in the rest of our state's rivers. Our land city producer, Laura Paskus, went to the Rio Grande to explore that issue with Audubon Southwest's Paul Taschen. For decades, the Rio Grande downstream of Albuquerque has dried during irrigation season. Not a lot of people pay attention to that, but this summer, in July, the drying marched upstream into Albuquerque, and people noticed. What most people probably don't realize is rivers in New Mexico don't have rights to their own waters. So the water you see flowing past, it's all meant for someone else downstream. And sometimes what that means is there's not enough water left for the river itself and the species that rely upon it. Paul Taschen is Director of Freshwater Conservation for Audubon Southwest. Keeping water in rivers is something he thinks about a lot. 
In New Mexico, like many Western states, there are no inherent rights or claims that rivers have on their water. Water in New Mexico is managed on what's called the priority administration system. And this is like most other Western states managed on a similar system. And it's a really, it's a system of extraction. It's, it's a winner take all kind of system. Um, and how it works is that permits are issued for water right users until there's no water left. In New Mexico, when dry times strike, people with the oldest water rights, senior water rights, get water first. And unless people decide to share shortages, junior or newer water rights can get cut. But the oldest users, the rivers themselves, their ecosystems, their wildlife, they can be left with nothing. These water right permits were issued during wetter times. And they were issued under this model of prior appropriation where there are more water right permits than there is water in the system. And that was before we really started seeing the impacts of climate change. It's clear dry riverbeds are bad for fish, cottonwood forests, all the species, including humans, who rely on them. Dry rivers aren't good for water management itself. Just to move water down to farmers downstream or to be moving water for delivering it to our neighboring states like Texas, uh, having a dry river is not an efficient way or an effective way to move water. So it, it, across the board, uh, dry rivers are detrimental. There are ways to change this. New Mexico has developed tools to keep water in rivers uh, within the water rights system. And it's, I, I think that's really important. I mean, I criticize the priority administration system, but to dismantle it isn't feasible. We have a strategic water reserve, which is used to keep water in rivers for rare animals protected under the Endangered Species Act. Fish like the Rio Grande silvery minnow, the Pecos bluntnose shiner, and the pike minnow in the San Juan River. To help those species, the state can lease water from willing farmers. Another tool is this thing called dynamic water leasing. It's sort of a newer tool that's being developed by irrigation districts, and it's one where the irrigation districts themselves are leasing water from willing leases, and it's put in a similar kind of bank, stored and used for environmental purposes. But there is so much more to do. We're the only Western state that doesn't have an environmental flow program. And it's been talked about for a long time. What an environmental flow program does is it uses the tools uh, that I've talked about and other tools locally to try to find creative solutions. And it really shifts the game. It shifts it from one, when you're managing for endangered species, it's out of fear of litigation. So it leads to kind of edgy management. And I've seen this. Um, but if you shift it to what do local communities want, what is important, what tools work in that local community, it's a much different way of managing a system. So I think that's really important. The endangered species are, are critical and important, but it's when you're dealing with endangered species, you're almost, you're, you're ready at a crisis point. Once a river dries and then dries the next year and dries again, we get used to that. We accept dry or broken rivers as normal. We even stop remembering, stop telling stories about what a living river was like. El Paso is pretty remarkable to see the river down there. It's basically a large concrete channel with maybe a thread of leftover sewage water or something running in its, its bottom. It's really, really degraded. And there's no corridor of trees around it. It's just a futuristic, concrete, post-apocalyptic kind of ditch. Uh, versus here, you know, we have a, a corridor of uh, cottonwood and willow trees and grasslands and a flowing river. It's quite different. It's hard to go back. You can't like, you know, necessarily go back. A place like El Paso, you can't all of a sudden restore that river down there. So once it's gone, it's gone. In New Mexico, our rivers have taken care of us for centuries, forever. And if we want to keep them, it's time for us to be giving back. For Our Land and New Mexico in Focus, I'm Laura Paskus. Hey, don't forget, next week we start our candidate conversations with Race for Governor, the Race for Navajo Nation President, and our three congressional districts as well. Thanks again for joining us and for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you next week in Focus.
Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you.